Most people don't spend their time thinking, you know, I really need a high priest. That's not really a common thought on anybody's mind. And yet the Bible goes to great lengths to tell you that you, in fact, do need a high priest. All of us do. And so when you get to Hebrews chapter 7, you get to the main argument in Hebrews about how Jesus is our high priest after the order of this guy called Melchizedek. And what's interesting about Melchizedek is that he's really only found in three books of the Bible, really three passages of the Bible if you want to be particular about it. On the screen here, I've got the, um, the, the three passages. There's Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20, which we'll read in just a moment. You might just put your um, marker there in Hebrews 7, go back to Genesis 14 in your Bible. We'll read together in just a moment. And then the second passage is Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. There is no psalm that's, or no Old Testament passage really that's quoted more frequently than Psalm 110. And one of the things that Psalm 110 says in verse 4 is that God has sworn to His Son, you will be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then we come to our present passage in Hebrews chapter 7 where Melchizedek and his work and his, um, his lineage or heritage, if you will, Jesus as a priest after the order of Melchizedek is expounded in Hebrews chapter 7. So what I'd like for us to do is I'm going to put a chart up here. And again, this is on the handout. Like I said, I spent a lot of time on that. So I hope you appreciate that. I just, you know, I, I need approval and I need appreciation for these things. It's not just putting some words on a page now. But um, there is a timeline there and it looks like this. And what I propose to do is let's look at the passages that deal with Melchizedek in the Old Testament and let's put some things on the timeline and see what we can learn about Melchizedek and his work as expounded and explained in the Bible. Go into your Bible to Genesis 14 if you're not already there. We're going to read verses 17 through 20. Genesis 14 beginning in verse 17. This is an account of Abram. He goes to rescue Lot because Lot is captured by some kings and the scripture says that Abram takes his men and his army and he goes and he defeats these kings. And it says in verse 17 of Genesis 14, after Abram's return from the defeat of Chertolaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shabe, that is the king's valley. Genesis 14, 18 now. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem. That is a precursor. It's the place where Jerusalem would ultimately be. Okay, Salem. It's the place where Jerusalem would ultimately be. And Melchizedek, it says in verse 18, is the king of Salem. It says he brought out bread and wine. And then in parentheses it says Melchizedek was priest of God Most High. Everybody see that in verse 18? So, when we're thinking about who Melchizedek is, back here in Genesis 14... In verse 18, the scripture tells us that he's the king of Salem and that he is priest of God. And that's important. Melchizedek is a priest, king. He's both of those things, okay? Um, he's a priest, that is, he is a representative of people who want to approach God. Melchizedek does that. But he's also a king. He's a ruler over the city of Salem, which would later become Jerusalem. And so it says in verse 19, Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then it says, and this is important in Hebrews 7, Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So Abram has all these possessions and all this wealth that he's captured from these foreign kings. And Abram takes a tenth of all of it and gives it to Melchizedek. And the reason why he gives it to Melchizedek is because he's giving it, you see, to God. Um, he's giving this as a tithe, as an offering to God. And he gives it through by means of Melchizedek, the king of Salem. That's all you get about Melchizedek in Genesis, just those four or five verses verses 17 through 20. Now, what I want you to know as you look at our timeline here, and I'm doing this for time's sake because there's just not enough minutes in the hour to, to deal with everything. This all happens, this stuff with Melchizedek, around 2000 BC. That's when Abram lived. That's when he was leaving Ur and going to the land of promise and all of that. That was about 2000 BC. Six centuries later, about 1400 BC, God delivers the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham out of Egypt, 
and he brings them to Mount Sinai. That's what my triangle is. This is Sinai, see? And when God brings them to Mount Sinai, he gives them the law of Moses. And the law of Moses says that the priests, they have to be Levites. Remember, they had to be from the tribe of Levi. The priests had to come from that particular tribe. But the kings, okay, the kings were supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. And so when you got to the old law, the Old Testament, the, uh, the law of Moses, God says, I want the priests to come from this tribe and I want the kings to come from this tribe. And therefore, nobody can be a priest king anymore. You can't be both at the same time under the law of Moses. It's just not possible. The word of God says you can't do it. And so that division is important because that's why the Hebrews writer is telling us in Hebrews 7 about Melchizedek and why he's important. So there's this division that happens. But then about 400 years after, you see this was in 1400 B.C., in about 1000 B.C., David, who was a king, wrote Psalm 110. So now turn in your Bibles there if you would. Psalm 110. So Genesis 14, you've got Melchizedek and the account of Abram bringing tithes to Melchizedek and Melchizedek blessing Abraham, Abram at that time. And now in Psalm 110, we've got David writing. And in Psalm 110, David the king speaks about God, okay? And it's really important what's happening here. In Psalm 110 verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You read over that and you think, what in the world does that mean? This is a conversation between God the Father and Christ the Son. God the Father, the Lord, Yahweh in this passage, says to my Lord, Jesus Christ. Yahweh says to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I I make your enemies your footstool. And then he goes on in verse 2, the Lord sends forth from Zion, okay, he's speaking to Jesus. He's talking about his royalty. He says, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. So, God is speaking prophetically to the Messiah, and the Messiah, according to verse 2, is going to be a ruler. He's going to be a king. Everybody see that? Rule in the midst of your enemies, Okay, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. So verses one through three. Okay, I'm with you so far, David. You're speaking about this messianic figure who's going to come. And God says to him, sit at my right hand and rule in the midst of your enemies. He's going to be a king. That makes sense. But then look at verse four, Psalm 110 110 verse four. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you, Messiah, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so what you find now in Psalm 110 is that God is prophetically speaking of someone who is going to be a priest king. And the question is, well, how can that be? Because In the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, priests and kings couldn't be the same person. It's impossible. Kings have to be different from the priests because they're from different tribes. They cannot be the same individual. But here is David speaking prophetically in Psalm 110 verses 1 through 4 and saying that the Messiah, the one who comes, is going to be both a king and a priest. And for a thousand years, that prophecy just kind of hung there. People were curious about it. They didn't understand all that it meant, obviously. They speculated about it. They wrote, you know, they wrote all kinds of documents and argued and and thought about it. What does it mean? But they can't make sense of it. How does this all work? Until you get to the book of Hebrews. And what Hebrews is doing, Hebrews is telling you how Jesus can fulfill both this prophecy and can do away with the old law, the Old Testament system. Okay? And so 
this stuff about Melchizedek, it's a, it's a line with just three, three passages. You've got Genesis 14, you've got Psalm 110, then you've got the stuff in Hebrews about Melchizedek. And that's really it. There's no other book in the Bible that even mentions Melchizedek. But when you trace all that's happening here, it helps us to understand Jesus better. It helps us to see him more clearly and to understand what he's done for us on our behalf. And so Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 7, what the writer is doing is he's saying, what happens with Jesus is that he is a priest and he is our king. He's both of those things, even though he's not a Levite and even though the old law says what it says. Jesus can be a priest king because of Melchizedek. Does that make sense so far? Any questions about that just yet? Okay. All right. So, with all that in mind, I'm going to give you another graph. This is not on your handout. How is it that Jesus could be a priest? Because Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. In fact, go to your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Hebrews 7 tonight, obviously. But uh, I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14. Hebrews 7 verse 14. I want you to look very carefully at that verse. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 14. He's making the case in Hebrews 7 that Jesus is a priest... And his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. And he says in Hebrews 7 verse 14, he said, It is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing concerning priests. So, on our chart here, Abraham, biblically, is the father of the faithful. He is our forerunner, if you will, our progenitor. And from Abraham's descendants come both Judah and Levi. Those were real individuals, real men. And the priesthood was supposed to come through Levi, but through Judah was supposed to come the king. And certainly, the Hebrews writer is saying in Hebrews 7 verse 14, well, everybody knows Jesus came from Judah. And if you wonder why sometimes those those genealogies of Jesus are in the New Testament. Uh, in Matthew chapter 1 or in Luke chapter 3, both of those passages, Matthew 1 and Luke 3, they give you the lineage of Jesus. And they both affirm that Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. So he's not a Levite. And so the question in Hebrews 7 is, well, how can Jesus be a priest? If you're saying we need a high priest and Jesus is our great high priest and he's the one that goes to God on our behalf, how is it possible that he is our high priest? And the answer that Hebrews 7 gives is, he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. It's not a Levitical priesthood, it's a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Which, by the way, bypasses, he's going to make this argument in Hebrews 7, it bypasses all the stuff with the law of Moses over here. All of those things, that priesthood, that was temporary. It was not able to make people perfect. In fact, um, he's going to say that in this passage in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 7. If perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been for another priest to rise after the order of Melchizedek? So, we're talking about how it is, how is it legitimate that Jesus could be our high priest? And the answer that the Hebrews writer gives is Jesus is our priest after the order of Melchizedek. This was prophesied in Psalm 110 verse 4. And now we see it fulfilled in Jesus and the work that he has accomplished. So he's appointed by God. God swears that he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's the big picture of this chapter of Hebrews 7. Okay, I tried to do it graphically so that you could see it. And then we'll just kind of go into some of the details here in just a moment. Are there any questions just yet? Yes, sir. So, so then this is also a defense that the old covenant has been done away with for a new covenant because you couldn't follow this path in the old covenant, therefore a new one has come. Yep. 
Alex is saying, if you can't hear, he's saying this is also a defense of the idea that the old covenant has been done away and now there's a new covenant. And that's exactly right. In fact, he's going to say in, um, in verse, verses 11 and 12, really, um, no, yeah, verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 7, um, where there's a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. Hebrews 7 verse 12. What he's saying is the priesthood is so important this, this concept of who represents us before God, that's such an important concept that you can't change that without throwing the entire law out altogether. Uh, the, the law has to be changed. If you, if you say the priesthood is somehow different, that Jesus is this priest after the order of Melchizedek, you've just got to do away with the old law, which is what's been done in order for a new law to come into place. Okay. Anybody else? Good question. Or comments? All right. Let's dive into Hebrews chapter 7 then tonight, okay? Um, I'm not going to circle words and underline things. I just decided I would go and and, uh, do it this way. Um, There's a lot of information here. And so, if you're taking notes on your handout, we're just going to fill in your notes. Um, We're going to look at these things one, one, one passage at a time. It says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1, This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. We just read about that a moment ago in Genesis 14. It says in verse 2, And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. We read about that in Genesis 14. He he is first, by translation of his name, Melchizedek is, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. So, who is Melchizedek? Verse 1 tells us that he is a priest king. Everybody see that in verse 1? He's the king of Salem. He's the priest of the Most High God. So, who is Melchizedek? He's a priest king. Nobody under the old law could be a priest king. So, it's good for Melchizedek and it's good for us that Melchizedek came centuries before the law of Moses did. Melchizedek was a priest king, but once Moses and the law of Moses came into being, there were no priest kings until now Jesus comes along. And so Melchizedek was a priest king, and that's important. He was both of those things at once. Secondly, it says in verse 2, Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham. That's going to be a big deal in just a minute as we continue in Hebrews chapter 7. But Abraham gave a tenth of all that he had won from these kings to Melchizedek. His name, Melchizedek, means literally king of righteousness. But he's also the king of Salem. And the word Salem means peace, shalom, right? So, his his title is he's the king of peace. And what the Hebrews writer wants us to see is that Melchizedek is a forerunner. He's a type of Christ. He's showing us some things about Melchizedek. What do we know about Melchizedek that's also characteristic of Jesus? Well, Melchizedek, according to this passage, is a priest king. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. And he's also the king of peace. And all those things pertain to Jesus as well. Now, look at verse 3, and this has caused quite a bit of consternation with people over the years. It says in Hebrews 7, verse 3, he, Melchizedek, is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Some people have taken that to mean that Melchizedek is a pre-incarnate Christ, that he literally was Jesus just, you know, Jesus came and ruled over the city of Jerusalem for a time and was priest over the city of Jerusalem for a time. And Abraham came and, you know, pre-incarnate Christ. I don't think that's what the Hebrews writer is saying here. Rather, what I believe is that the Hebrews writer is just telling us the way he's presented Melchizedek in Scripture is different from most of the other people that you encounter in the Old Testament. I mean, think about it. Most everybody else that you encounter in the Old Testament, it tells you who their, their uh, father was, who their grandfather, sometimes their great-grandfather, sometimes their great-great-grandfather, and so on and so forth. It gives you their lineage. And not only that, it talks about he lived, he was born, he lived so many years and reigned so many years over this, uh, this country, and then he died. And then so-and-so reigned in his place. 
And that's the way most of the kings that you read about in the Old Testament are presented. But not Melchizedek. This guy, he's just there. Genesis 14, verse 17, there he is. And Genesis 14, verse 20, there he goes. And there's no lineage that's described, although I believe Melchizedek was just a man. There's no, uh, you know, there's no length of his rule that's described. He reigned for so many years in Jerusalem. He, he served as a priest over. It doesn't give you any of that information. That's all the Hebrews writer is saying. He's saying this is the way he's presented in Scripture. And in that sense, because he is a priest and there's no, there's no parameters, there's no um, beginning and end that's given in Scripture, because that's the way Scripture presents Melchizedek, he, in that sense, is also a type of Christ because he continues as a priest forever. Verse 3. Questions or comments about all that? Okay. So, this Melchizedek just mentioned once in Genesis and then once again in Psalm 110. And all of a sudden, we're seeing all kinds of things about how Jesus is our high priest and how he's superior to Abraham and, and all these things because of who Melchizedek is. Look at verses 4 through 10. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is their brothers, though these are descended from Abraham. But this man, verse 6, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. So, what do we know about Melchizedek? We know that he is superior to Abraham. And that's important for the argument here. He's, a, he's superior to Abraham for two specific reasons. Number one, because he received tithes from Abraham. In the Old Testament, when you wanted to give something to God, you had to have a representative. You couldn't, just, you couldn't just walk up and say, you know, here, God, I donate you my, you know, my, my $20 bill. You couldn't just do that. If you wanted to give something to God, you had to give to a representative. If you want to make a sacrifice, you had to take the sacrifice. And the priest, your representative, had to offer the sacrifice on your behalf. And there were all kinds of rules and rituals that went along with that. But you couldn't just come and bring whatever you wanted to God. It wasn't direct, like the way we, are, we, we enjoy now because of what Jesus has done for us. I can bring my gifts and my offerings and my sacrifices and my praise directly to God. And Jesus is my high priest. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't always that way. And so when Abraham comes and he wants to give a tenth of what he has won, a tenth of his spoils to God, he has to give it to Melchizedek. So he received tithes from Abraham. It shows that Melchizedek is superior to Abraham. And not only that, in verse 7, he blesses Abraham. That's the second reason why he's superior. He blessed him. And then in verses 8 through 10 of Hebrews chapter 7, one of the things the writer says is that even Levi himself, look at verse 9, one might even say that Levi himself who receives tithes paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. And so the Hebrews writer is saying symbolically, even Levi, who is the priest, the, the father of the priesthood, even Levi gave tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek, symbolically speaking. Levi had not been born yet, would not be born for many years, but symbolically he gives tithes to Melchizedek. And the point of all this is that Melchizedek is superior to Abraham. God made a great promise to Abraham, actually several promises to Abraham, and we are the inheritors of those promises but the scripture is saying here that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who is for this purpose, for the Hebrews writer's purpose, Jesus is superior to Melchizedek. Everybody understand questions or comments? Okay. Continue in the passage. Now we look at verses 11 through 19 and the, the discussion turns, we're still talking about Melchizedek, but the discussion turns now to the Levitical priesthood those Levites that were priests and, and the, the work that they did. What was, you know, what, what were some things that we need to be aware of about the Levitical priesthood? Well, look at verse 11, Hebrews 7 verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, in parentheses, 
What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? So the first thing about the Levitical priesthood that's stated here is it could not bring perfection. That doesn't mean that God's trying to make us all perfect in the sense of we're sinlessly perfect. That's not what's being spoken of here. We're talking about the Levitical priesthood because of the sacrifices that were offered, they were inadequate ultimately to take away our sin. He's going to get to that in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, not in an ultimate sense. And in that sense, then they cannot bring perfection. The Levitical priesthood was there. It was temporary. It was God's will. This was serving God and bringing these sacrifices, these, these bulls and these goats and these, these sheep, bringing all those things. That was God's will for the Israelites. But those things could never bring perfection. That's why we need a greater high priest. That's why Jesus is necessary. Notice again, as you look at verse 12, for when there is a change in the priesthood, this goes to Alex's point just a few moments ago, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it's evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. That's Hebrews 7, verses 12 through 14. The law, the Levitical priesthood, is bound up with the law of Moses. They go together. They are inextricable. You can't separate them. If you, if you change the priesthood, the law's got to be changed too, is what he's saying. Because the priesthood was that critically important to the law of Moses. You can't just, it's, it's not just a, you know, a, a replaceable part. You know, let's take out the Levites and let's put in the Melchizedek and, and then everything else continues. That's not the way it works. God's saying that the Levitical priesthood was such a central part of the law of Moses that if you change the priesthood, then the law itself has to be changed. And he's going to get more detailed about that argument when we get to chapter 8. So when people say, you know, sometimes when they talk about the law of Moses today, a lot of our religious neighbors will say, the law of Moses, the Old Testament, it contains three kinds of laws. There's the civil law, laws for the nation. There's the ceremonial law, the laws that have to do with sacrifices and temple rituals. And then there's the moral law. Have you ever heard somebody say something like that? So the civil and the ceremonial and the moral law and... And what they'll say typically is, you know, the ceremonial and the civil law, those things were done away, but the moral law has stayed. And so we still, we still keep the Ten Commandments, they'll say, because that's the moral law, not the civil and the ceremonial law. And the Hebrews writer is saying, no, all of the law has been taken out of the way. And I don't know any passage, by the way, in the scriptures. I've talked to people about this over the years. I don't know anywhere in your Old or New Testament where you can find the very clear distinction between the civil, the ceremonial, and the moral law. I, I don't know where you turn to find that. I know it's very convenient to say that for purposes of thinking that we're still under parts of the Old Testament, but you don't find that distinction being made anywhere. What you find instead is the Hebrews writer saying, if you change the priesthood, if you want to call that the ceremonial law, if you're going to change that, you got to change all of it. Because it all goes together. It's all bound up together. Make sense? Questions? And so when our religious friends, are, when, when we, you know, what, what law are we under? You've got, you've got the Bible and there's a lot of books in this Bible. And how do I know what God wants me to do? You cannot go to the Old Testament to find what you need to do to be saved and to please God today. That doesn't mean you can't learn from the Old Testament. You can learn a lot of things from the Old Testament. We're learning about Melchizedek right now. But you cannot go to the Old Testament to find what you need to do to become a Christian, to please God, to serve Jesus Christ. So the law and the Levitical priesthood are bound up together. Verse 14 displays a principle that's very important. The principle is the silence of Scripture. Um, don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this, but God authorizes by what He says, not by what He does not say. I'm going to say that again. God authorizes by what He says. He does not authorize by what He does not say. In other words, when God speaks, we ought to obey. And sometimes God speaks very generically. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. 
That's a very generic statement. You can go in a lot of different ways. You can go to a lot of different places. God didn't tell you specifically where, which countries to visit. He just said, go into all the world. He didn't tell you how to go. He didn't tell you whether you got to fly or drive or swim. However you go, go and preach the gospel. So God's generic in that. But also God is specific sometimes. When God speaks about worship, for example, He speaks about singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord in Ephesians 5 verse 19. He's very specific about the kind of music He wants. He wants to hear our voices, the fruit of our lips, the sacrifice of praise. He wants to hear our hearts. And He's very specific about the kind of music that He desires. And the silence of Scripture means that if we understand how to understand God's Word, when God has spoken, we are outside of His authority. If we go to some other other category, you know, in in the same category, some other thing, and say, I want to bring this in. Um, The analogy that's often used is if I go to the restaurant and I order the number one combo with a large Coke, okay, and all of a sudden the guy comes and he brings me the number one combo with a large Coke, but he also brings me a gallon of milk. And then he says, here, I just thought you might want this. No, I didn't ask for that. I told you what I wanted. Don't bring me something that I didn't ask for. Um, That's the way the silence of Scripture works. And so here you've got in Hebrews 7 verse 14, the Bible itself is saying, look, God said, I want all the priests to come from the tribe of Levi. Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. But God never said, oh, and the, the high priest can't, can't come from Judah. He didn't say that. He just said Levi. And once he said Levi, no other tribes are eligible to be priests because of the principle of the silence of Scripture. God authorizes by what He says. Nobody else can become a priest under the old law because God said the Levites are to be the priests. And so Jesus can't be a priest under the old law but he can be our high priest because Melchizedek came centuries before the old law was put into place. Questions or thoughts? Okay. Look again at the passage. Look if you would at verse, um, let's look at verses 18 and 19. Hebrews 7 verses 18 and 19. Um, For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So, what do we find in this passage? We find that the Levitical priesthood, as well as the law, it says very literally, has been set aside. It's been done away, Hebrews 7 verse 18. Don't try to go back. This is his argument through the whole book. Don't try to go back to the Old Testament and try to be saved. You can't. You can't go back to the Old Testament and try to find a relationship with God anymore. That priesthood has been set aside. And not only that, but something much better, a better hope has been introduced, verse 19. And so, the law of Moses, as we said last week, has always been a one-way sign. It always pointed to a Messiah that was coming. This priest king, Psalm 110, this one who is going to rule in the midst of his enemy, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And also it was sworn by God that he was going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This Messiah is going to be a priest king and he cannot rule and he cannot be a priest under the old law. It's impossible for that to happen because God's word forbids it. But God made a provision even within the old law in Psalm 110. There's going to be a priest king and he's going to come and he's going to fulfill both those roles, both those functions. Well, how can that happen? Because of Melchizedek, because Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek and Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and that proves his superiority. That's why this is so important. Then turn next to verses 20 through 28. Now we get down to the really, the really rubber meets the road, practical, important part. All of this discussion, the first 19 verses about Melchizedek, all of this is driving towards these last nine verses, 20 through 28. Jesus is our better high priest. Let's talk about why that's the case. Look at Hebrews chapter 7, begin in verse 20. It was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one, Jesus, verse 21, was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. 
He said that in Psalm 114. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant, it says in verse 22. And so, the first thing that makes Jesus better as a high priest is the fact that not only, not only did God appoint him to be priest, but God swore with an oath, you are a priest forever. He has sworn that this will come to pass. So, God has sworn to Jesus that he would make him a priest. God never swore to Aaron or to any of those other priests that came from the descendancy of Aaron. He never swore to them or made an oath to them that they were going to be priests. But he did swear and make an oath to this one, to Jesus, that he was going to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verses 23 and 24. The former priests, it says, were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. What's the problem with those Old Testament priests? They kept dying. Even if you were a really good priest, you're not going to live forever. And then it says in verse 25, uh, excuse me, verse 24, but he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And so, what makes Jesus a better high priest? Jesus has died and risen, and Jesus is now going to continue forever. He is a priest who is never going to cease his priestly function. He holds his priesthood, the Bible uses this word, permanently. Jesus was not a priest while he was here on earth in his earthly ministry. He could not have been a priest in his earthly ministry. Why not? Because the Levites had to be the priests. But when Jesus died and when Jesus rose from the dead, God said, now sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. You are now a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God swore to him and made him permanently our high priest. That's the function of Hebrews. That's what it's telling us about who he is. Look at verse 25. Consequently, because he continues forever, he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The Old Testament, the Old Testament constantly reminded you of your sin over and over and over again. You always had to bring sacrifices every year back to the altar, and you had to constantly keep making atonement for sin. And this book, Hebrews, is saying you don't have to do that now as a Christian. Because Jesus, our high priest, he himself is the sacrifice. And not only that, but he has, he has a permanent priestly ministry and he is able to save to the nth degree, to the farthest regions possible. He can save you. That is a comforting passage, Hebrews 7 verse 25. There's nothing you have done in your life that Jesus cannot save you. If you'll come to him, if you'll fall upon his mercy, if you'll do what he says, if you'll be faithful to him, he will save you to the uttermost. He's that kind of a high priest. And he constantly lives to make intercession for us. That tells us in Hebrews 7 verse 25, he's praying for us. He's petitioning God on our behalf. Then look at verse 26. It says, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. I'll just put it down in this one word. Verse 26, Jesus is sinless. Every other high priest committed sin. They were all just, just human beings like us. They were weak. They were sinners. But not Jesus. He's holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. In every conceivable way, Jesus is better than the Old Testament high priests. Every conceivable way. Then look at verse 27. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. He's exalted in a better place to intercede, and he offered himself once for all. Next two items on your handout. In verse 26, I didn't talk about this, but the fact that Jesus is at the right hand of God's throne. The fact that God said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus is in the perfect place to intercede for us. He's in the very presence of God, and he stays there. He remains there, and he can intercede for us continually. He's exalted. He's in a better place. And then verse 27 tells us that Jesus is a better high priest because he offered himself once for all. He's going to elaborate, the Hebrews writer is, on that more. Jesus is, 
what's really cool about all this, when you start looking at the Old Testament, you see all these different things, kind of like we talked about last week, the milk and the meat. All these different facts in the Old Testament about, about priesthood and about Passover and about sacrifices and about, um, you know, covenants and, and all kinds of things about some guy named Melchizedek. Um, all these things are there in the Old Testament and all of them, they contain strands. And if you follow if you follow the development of these themes, the development of the theme of a covenant or the development of the theme of Melchizedek, or if you follow the development of the theme of a Passover lamb, um, all of them find their fulfillment in Jesus and his work. And that's what the Old Testament is trying to get us to do. That's the meat. When you see how Jesus fulfills all these things and you start to understand that these threads, these are not just, oh, that's nice, that's, that's intellectually fascinating. These are the very foundation of our faith. We believe in Jesus because in every way he is qualified to be our high priest and he's not going to quit being our high priest and we can come to him and he can save us to the uttermost. But we get to that conclusion by following these threads. We take the milk and we, we put it together and we, we use it and we we become mature and we synthesize all that. That's what the Hebrews writer is doing for us. And so Jesus, in that sense, he's not just our high priest in Hebrews, he's also our sacrifice. So he himself is the sacrifice, but he's also the priest, but he's also the king. And he's all those things at once. And that's why he's such a wonderful savior. And then look at verse 28, last verse in this chapter. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law, you see he's saying that in verse 28, Psalm 110 came 400 years after the law of Moses. That's what verse 28 is telling you. So the word of the oath, Psalm 110, came later than the law, but it appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. What's it saying? Same thing it says back in verse 1 about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest king. And now Jesus is our priest king. He is both our high priest and he is our king. And God foresaw that and promised that and swore it by an oath through David, his servant, in Psalm 110, a thousand years before Jesus was born. All those things come together in a wonderful tapestry, a wonderful blend to show us the greatness of Jesus Christ. I started out tonight by saying most people don't go around walking around, you know, during your day thinking, you know, I really need a good priest. I really need somebody to represent me to God. But you do. You need somebody who can represent you to God because you can't stand before him all by yourself. You need somebody who is holy and innocent and sinless and is an advocate for you and understands you and knows what makes you tick and understands your temptations. You need somebody like that. And that's exactly what Jesus came to be for us. And when we walk away from Hebrews 7, we shouldn't just see Melchizedek. We better see Jesus shining brighter than anything else in this chapter. Questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you guys very much for your attention this evening. We'll continue with chapter 8, Lord willing, next week.